posing the kind of, I guess, like, you know, philosophical whatever question. Is anyone truly free? Or maybe rephrase it, does free will actually exist? You don't have to answer it, but something to think about. Is anyone actually truly free? Does free will actually exist? Because in one sense, the book of Judges answers this question with a no. We are all motivated, inspired, or controlled by something. Like, for example, if we want people to like us, we are enslaved to the opinions of others. Or if we want to feel secure and safe, oftentimes we are enslaved to making money or finding the perfect partner that could protect and provide for us. Or let's say if we want to take control over our lives and no longer be bossed around by people or by some primitive concept of the divine, we're oftentimes enslaved to the concept of power. Just like the polytheistic societies of old, gods that promise to fulfill our deepest and greatest desires are still all around us. And in this contemporary, almost marketplace of gods, we all choose a god or gods to serve and live under, hopefully free from judgment from others, in our personal pursuit or in an individual pursuit of fulfillment. It's as how the book of Judges concludes at the very end, all people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. In other words, I do me, you do you, and we don't judge. The book of Judges took place roughly around the year 1200 BC, uh, plus or minus a couple centuries. It was a time between the prophet Moses and Joshua's death and the appointing of the first kings of Israel. And the promised land or, or the land of Canaan was a spiritually pluralistic society where both believers of God or Yahweh and the idol worshiping pagans both dwelled. God's people were constantly faced with a choice. Do we follow the God of our ancestors or do we follow the latest trends of our pagan neighbors? And if you know anything about the book of Judges, God's people constantly make the wrong decision. And as a result, God disciplines them to draw them back to him by raising up judges or a better word would be like heroes almost to liberate the people, his people, once they cry out in repentance for, and for salvation. But as time goes on, even the judges themselves become increasingly sketchy uh, and do horrible things. And the cycle repeats over and over again. And so if the book of Judges was meant to convince skeptics that the God of the Bible is real, in one sense, it doesn't do that great of a job. Because in the book of Judges, God's people constantly fail. They're hypocrites. They're disciplined, and they come to their senses and ask for help only to repeat the cycle again the next generation. Of God's existence in the book of Judges. If the point of the book of Judges was to show us how consistently obedient and morally upstanding the followers of God are, it utterly fails at the task. But if the point of the book of Judges Judges was meant to remind us that humanity truly cannot thrive apart from their covenant relationship with the God of Scripture, then we're getting somewhere. So I have three points for today's uh, introductory sermon to the book of Judges. The first is the courageousness of true faith. The second point is confusing momentary success with faithful obedience. And the third point is the divine dilemma in Judges. The first point, the courageousness of true faith. Let's read verse 1 of Judges chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, which tribe should go first to attack the Canaanites? Now the book of Judges opens by pointing back to Joshua, who had just passed away. The point is to contrast the, cour the courage of Joshua with the fickle faith of the generations after him. This is how the book starts. After the Israelites were initially liberated from slavery in Egypt, the entire generation of those that knew slavery in Egypt died in the wilderness over the course of 40 years. The entire generation, all but two, those two being Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses did not survive the journey to the promised land. God 
granted him the grace to see the promised land right before they crossed the river Jordan, but he did not enter it himself. In that sense, Joshua was indeed special. He was uh, Moses' successor, chosen by God to lead God's people after Moses died upon reaching the border into the promised land. And when they were in the wilderness and scouting the promised land, all the Israelite spies returned with terrible news about the Canaanites and how powerful, how large, and how big they were. Again, all the spies, but two, Joshua and Caleb. Indeed, they actually returned and tried to rally God's people to be courageous and to continue to trust in God because of all the miracles and all the power he demonstrated in their liberation from Egypt. Whatever terrifying enemy, whatever hunger or thirst or whatever suffering God's people endured, these two, Joshua and Caleb, remained faithful and trusted in God through it all. The book of Joshua, which takes right before the book of Judges, is a reminder that our covenant God always keeps his promises so we don't need to be afraid when we're facing our enemies. It's men and leaders like Joshua that God raises up to inspire his people to true, unwavering faith in times of great uncertainty. And so following Joshua's footsteps, the book of Judges opens. You've seen what God has done through Joshua. Will you take up his mantle and follow in his footsteps and trust in God's promises for you? That's essentially how it's opening up. Now, I'm not one of those pastors that tells people, you know, God is telling you to like, you know, immediately sell everything and quit your jobs because you're called to give up your life on the mission field. Um, I'm Presbyterian, which means I believe in processes and I believe in committees. And so I believe in taking these things very slowly. Uh, I think committees or groups of people, not your mom or your mentors, should assess your readiness for vocational ministry. I believe decisions must be accompanied by a lot of prayer and that it's wiser to take it slow than to rush these things. But when an individual believer of mature faith who has prayerfully wrestled with the situation for months, if not years, and they are inviting their pastors for input, has saved up money to pay for their bills in case they have to quit their job, decides to then quit their job to go on a short-term, not long-term, but short-term mission trip, there's something incredibly courageous about this. You know, I'll never be the one to tell you that it's God's will for you to do that. But if you prayed about it, you saved up money for emergency situations like this and invited your spiritual leaders uh, in your decision-making process, and you've proven your spiritual maturity repeatedly in the past, and you can't shake off the conviction that you need to do something radical, like quitting your job to go on a mission trip for a few weeks, then I say go for it. Man, just go for it then. Rosewick has your back. Might be a little irresponsible, but I can't be the judge of that in the end. I say go for it and see what happens. Honestly, in a world where believers are buying into the idolatry of safety and security, where we chase after higher paying jobs or the best schools and more degrees, where we want to live in the safest neighborhoods or near the best schools for our kids, it's actually incredibly refreshing to see a believer once in a while say, now forget the American dream. I'm going to do something radical and risky so I can serve Jesus without any hindrances, even if it's just for a few weeks. If you ever feel like you don't experience the power of God in your life, don't blame it on him for not delivering or, or blame your inability to earn God's favor. Too often, the reason why we don't see God powerfully moving in our lives is because we lack the faith to trust in his strength. Sometimes we need to stop calculating and stop worrying. And we need to just obey, even if it's risky. My man, Jachi here, you're an inspiration to me. I hope you know that. And to many others in this room. I hope the Lord uses you as he used the prophet Joshua to inspire more around you to be courageous and take risks for Jesus. Second point, confusing momentary success with faithful obedience. You know, the rest of the chapter, which I can't, I don't have the time to read, uh, but I'll summarize it with some key verses here. The rest of the chapter um, surveys the successes and failures of the tribes of Israel in their conquest of the promised land. It's sad, actually. Because in verse 2, God literally says to the tribe of Judah, Judah, I've already granted you victory. 
So just go and do it. Just claim the land. But they still asked the tribe of Simeon for help after calculating their insufficient numbers. They went victory after victory together. And yet by verse 19, we learned that Judah had failed to drive out the people from the plains because of their iron chariots. Technology that they didn't have access to yet. Once again, they're calculative. Too smart for their own good. And instead of trusting in God's promises, they trust in their own research, their own studies, their own assessment, their own technology, and their own numbers. And they fail to finish the job. And, and, and these specific people become a massive thorn on their side for centuries to come. But who could fault them? They're still Bronze Age people. They don't have the technology yet to defeat iron weapons. This is a period in human history where there's a transition between the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, and God's people are still in the Bronze Age. I mean, it's basically common sense to wait, right, until they have the technology or the numbers to finish the job and, and to defeat their enemies, right? Who could blame them? That makes sense. And yet, that's not what God says to them. The problem with Judah's confusion with their momentary success with faithful obedience is that this mindset spreads to the other tribes of Israel. In the end, none of the other tribes are able to fully claim the land that was divinely allotted to them by God, even when God literally promises them victory if they just have faith and obey. Just take the risk, God says. Trust in my strength and not in yours. Personally, I think this is where this is where being entitled, overly educated, middle-class Christians can be a curse. We have no stomach for risk. Convenience overshadows obedience. Success trumps sacrifice. Retirement replaces generosity. We rely too much on our education to assess situations rather than fasting and praying about it first. We want to see surveys and reports before we invite others to pray. Then we justify our lack of full co commitment and obedience by saying things like, well, you know, at, at least I stream Sunday service online, even if I don't go to church in person every Sunday because I keep oversleeping. Or, you know, at, at least I, I try to go to church on Sundays, even if I don't show up to uh, the community outreach opportunities, even though I have time. Or you know, at, at least I, I give something even if I don't tithe my full commitment. Or, or well, I, I've forgiven him just a little bit, but I just don't ever want to see him again. I know y'all have thought these things because these thoughts come across my mind too. This is human. Very human. Very normal, especially for middle class Christians. Being middle class is the worst because it disciples us to pursue comfort. And to confuse half-hearted obedience as being enough. My challenge to all of us is we need to fight for greater spiritual self-awareness so that we resist these lies. In the middle of chapter 1, the story goes on a, on a brief tangent. We're told about Caleb. Remember, the other individual who never stopped trusting in God's promises from his time in slavery in Egypt. Um, and another family, the descendants of Moses' father-in-law. Verse 12, Caleb said, I will give my daughter, Axel, in marriage to one who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenez, or Kenez, was the one who conquered it, so Axel became Othniel's wife. When Axel married Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. As she got uh, uh, down off her donkey, Caleb asked her, what's the matter? And she said, let me have another gift. You have already given me the land in the Negev. Now please give me springs of water too. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. And when the tribe of Judah left Jericho, the city of Palms, the Kenites, who were the descendants of Moses' father-in-law, traveled with them into the wilderness of, of Judah. They settled among the people there near the town of Arad in the Negev. And now, I, I'm not going to lie, I think Caleb is a pretty cool dad. He's... Now, you can tell he's very sure of himself and he knows the God of Israel. And he wants to make sure whoever marries his daughter, Axel, is also confident and trusting God's strength and not on, not on his own strength. 
So he announces a challenge that whoever conquers this particular city will have earned his daughter's hand in marriage. It's a test of how much faith they have in God's promises and strength. He doesn't want some wimpy believer marrying his daughter. He's looking for a man of faith who can take risks and, and fight battles way larger than life because of his faith in God's strength to deliver him. And his nephew comes through and they get married, which wasn't weird back then, so don't judge. <laughs> then his daughter is like, cool, but can we get some springs of water too? She's just like her dad, sure of himself and fully trusting in God's promises that this is our land. This is the promised land. She's ready to claim God's promises for her and her family. Then we read about the Kenites who were the distant relatives of the Israelites and the descendants of Moses' father-in-law, who also traveled with the Israelites through the wilderness, trusting in God's promises for their family. The irony of Axel and the Kenites is that the model of radical risk-taking, faithful obedience in Judges 1 isn't the prototypical Israelite male, it's a woman and a foreigner. In the book of Judges, it is a prototypical, prototypical Israelite male, but in the book of Judges, it's a woman and a foreigner. In that sense, there really is no prototypical Israelite when we think of a model of radical risk-taking, faithful obedience. It can be anyone. Third and final point, the divine dilemma in Judges. Chapter 2, starting from verse 1, the angel of the Lord went up to went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give your ancestors. And I said, I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you are not to make any covenants with people living in this land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars. But you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land, they will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. When the angel of the Lord finished speaking to all of the Israelites, the people wept loudly. They called the place Bokim, which means weeping, and they offered sacrifices, sa sacrifices there to the Lord. Now chapter uh, one ends on a somewhat on, ominous or uncertain note. The Israelites failed to fully trust in God's strength and they compromised. In their faith, they compromise in, in their responsibility to claim the land. But chapter 2 begins with a reminder, first and foremost, of the gracious nature of God. We're told in verse 1 that the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. The narrator chooses to remind us where God is coming from to meet the Israelites, which was a city or village or town called Gilgal which literally means to roll because that was where in Joshua chapter 5, 9, in the book right before this, God says to Joshua, today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. Today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. This is where God forgave the Israelites of their sins, where he covenanted himself once more to them as their God, where he became a king and father to them all by his kindness and grace. But in chapter 2, verse 1, God continues and says, Well, you disobeyed my command. Which is odd because in chapter 1, verse 19, we read that the Israelites were unable to finish the job. Well, which is it? They disobeyed God's command to claim their land? Or did they, were they unable to finish the job? Here we see that obviously God cannot lie. So God isn't lying. Here we see the Israelites are actually making excuses. Well, God, we were unable to do this. We were unable to fully claim the land. We weren't able to do this because we were scared. Well, they have those iron weapons. We only have bronze ones. God, look at their numbers and how big they are. We're just a bunch of nomads. They say, we could not. But God says, you would not. So what was God's command? It was to not covenant themselves to local idol worshipers and to tear down their idols, which were used to sacrifice children. This was the military uh, purpose of the military campaign in Canaan. Let's be really clear about this. It was not ethnic cleansing because countless Canaanites had already repented and joined the Israelites through marriage. One primary example being Rahab, a prostitute, 
who marries into the line of Judah that one day produces the king David and ultimately Jesus himself. The Canaanites, we're told, many of them had repented and joined the Israelites once they heard of and saw Yahweh's power and graciousness. The purpose also wasn't imperialistic conquest because the Israelites were forbidden, explicitly forbidden, from taking plunder or slaves. The purpose was to cleanse the land of idols, especially since the Canaanite idol, uh, idol uh, Canaanite worship in particular, normalized child sacrifice. And so here lies the dilemma. God graciously promised to keep his covenant relationship with his people and to give them this land. But he cannot also give the land to an unrighteous people or a disobedient people. This is why God says in verse 2, why did you do this? Why did you go off and do this and put me in this difficult situation? You can almost hear the frustration. The other translations are very similar in, this, in how they translate this, uh, this question here. Why did you do this? This is what plays out throughout the book of Judges. Does God pro- compromise his covenant and give up on his people for failing to obey? Or does he compromise his holiness and give in to his people's compromised faith? Does God compromise his covenant and give up on his people for failing to obey? Or does he compromise his holiness and give in to the people's compromised faith? We're actually never given an answer in the book of Judges. But the narrative, as we'll see, builds up this dilemma, this divine dilemma. In fact, this divine dilemma plays out for another 1,200 years until God the Father climactically addresses this once and for all through his son, Jesus, through a process that we now call the doctrine of double imputation. Some of you may recognize this. I will forever preach this because it is the best news that humanity could ever hear. And I think this illustration is easy to understand. <laughs> so again, doctrine of double imputation. The word impute means to give credit to, let's say like into someone's bank account, for example. Impute, to give credit to. So you can impute credit to someone's account by sending them money. The doctrine of double imputation then says that our sin was imputed or transferred to Jesus because God's holiness demands that sin, that our sin and disobedience and half-hearted discipleship be punished. And as a result, Jesus was punished in our place because God saw in our in our sin, uh, God saw our sin in Jesus when he was on the cross. And on the flip side, another imputation happens where Jesus transfers to us his righteousness so that God now sees Jesus in us through which he can love us as his children just as he loves God, uh, Jesus as his own son. In other words, God's wrath was satisfied through Jesus' death on the cross through which we're forgiven and God is able to now continue his covenant relationship with his people because we're forever accepted into his family through Jesus' righteousness. In Judges, this plays out in the way that God graciously promised to keep his covenant relationship with his people, but he also cannot give the land to an unrighteous people. So, it's through Jesus that God is able to graciously keep his covenant relationship with his people and give us the true and better promised land, which is Jesus himself, to a people righteous by faith and not by works. Again, In Judges, God graciously promised to keep his covenant relationship with his people, but he also cannot give the land to an unrighteous people. But through Jesus, God graciously keeps his covenant relationship with his people and gives the promised land, which is ultimately Jesus himself, to a people righteous by faith. Close with this um, quote by the late Pastor Tim Keller, who says, without the gospel of Christ crucified, we will always either complacently give in to sin because of the unconditionality of his promises, meaning because God is so kind and forgiving and gracious. Or, on the flip side, we will live under a burden of guilt and fear because of the conditionality of his covenant, meaning that there will be punishment, discipline involved. 
The cross is where we find the tension resolved. So we are able to live forgiven, obedient lives, despite also living sinful, disobedient lives. The cross, Keller goes on to say, is the place where we find freedom to accept ourselves without being proud and to challenge ourselves without being crushed. I hope you're just as excited as me for the summer series. And I hope that we keep this in mind, that in Judges, that there is a tension here, a divine dilemma. And we are to experience this building frustration. And yet, we are to also remember and have a building sense of relief and gratitude. That even though we could not fulfill the covenant in the same way the people and judges could not, God still graciously made it possible to love us and give us his gracious, fulfill his gracious promises for us through Jesus by faith through the cross. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, just reflect on what was shared through the message today, Lord, help us to be challenged by the many saints in the past and in this very room who have accepted your challenge to your people to take risks, to do something radical as a norm for the Christian faith. by trusting in your promises that you will provide for us, that you will protect us. Thank you for the example of the many brothers and sisters who have done this. Help us to be challenged, to let go of any idols that we are tempted by in our lives as we think about the comforts and the safety of living middle-class lives in the West. Lord, we pray that as we begin the sermon series in Judges, that we're also reminded, constantly reminded, that we are no better than the people in the book of Judges, and without your grace, we'll probably even be worse. But you are still so kind through it all to forgive them and to forgive us ultimately through Jesus. to give us the promises that you gave them. They have something better for in store for us. The, the kingdom is ours to dwell in and to serve, and to call our home. So let us go, Lord, in faith and with courage and take risks for your kingdom. Let us be a community that supports those that do go because I'm sure not all of us will go at once. So as certain individuals do go, let us be a community that supports them, rallies around them with prayer, and to provide for them tangibly if the need arises. So we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.